Did medieval cooks prefer cast iron skillets or Teflon ones? Did they use gas, electric, or wood-burning ovens and stoves? And what about microwaves? Did medieval chefs yell and scream obscenities at their aides and scallions? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I am Professor Jerome Arkenberg and your host for this episode of History Waits for No One. I've been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. And in this video, I'll cover the kinds and layouts of cooking hearths, kitchens, and stoves, including bakehouses in use in medieval Europe. The pots, pans, cauldrons, spits, trivets, and other medieval cookware in use. The various utensils used in medieval cooking. The types of medieval cooks, chef, scullions, and kitchen wenches. Their behavior in the kitchen and reputation. And how these cooks and chefs prepared, seasoned, and cooked food. But first, make sure to click like, share, subscribe, and that little bell thingy to continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. The most basic form of medieval cooking was on an open fire, much like the ones you see here, or maybe here, with a cast iron cauldron like this, or like these, you see them here, with legs molded to its body or placed on a trivet set in the coals or hung from an adjustable hook attached to a beam or to a chimney crane, which is kind of like this is, the iron arm swinging horizontally so that the heat could be better regulated to avoid burning the food. So you can't set anything at a high flame or low flame or 350 degrees or less, they don't know how to do that and the technology isn't there. So how do you do that? Well, again, you can stoke the fire higher or lower, or maybe just like this cauldron here, you can raise or lower it. So right in the flames, obviously it's gonna cook hotter. Above the flames, not so hot. Obviously, the richer the household, the better equipped its kitchen, and the more refined its cuisine would be. And as a result, the more likely the employment of professional cooks and helpers would also be. However, the status of a medieval chef was low, as the stereotypical cook was male, hot-tempered, and prone to drunkenness. And some would say, some things never really change. At first, the hearth and kitchen and dining area all used the same room. And of course, in a medieval peasant house or most townhouses, that would have still have been the same. But for the upper classes, it would be the hall, which eventually, of course, you might call it the great hall, but among the really wealthy, and certainly in monasteries, the kitchen had its own room, or in some cases, even its own building, which might then be connected, and usually would be, with the great hall by a covered walkway or maybe a tunnel. And why would you do this? Well, in part, to minimize the danger of fire to the rest of the building, the building, the castle, the manor house, where you're, or monastery where you're living, also for diners to avoid the noise and smells of the kitchen. Thank you for that applause. Kitchens for the nobility and the upper classes usually had stone walls and floors, or maybe brick as the ones you see here. 
and more than one fireplace built against the walls so that more cooking could be done for on a vast scale for everybody who's shown up at one of your dinners. The kitchens of the Dukes of Burgundy, for example, had six stone hooded hearths built in pairs against three of the four walls. So two of them in each wall with a high window and sinks on the fourth wall and louvers on the roof to make sure it was all properly ventilated. Along with other windows high in the walls, remember you can't have the windows lower because the hearths are there, but higher on the, higher on the walls as the main source of light, complemented at times with candles and torches. And again, if you see elsewhere in another video, most medieval dining, the big dinners, unlike a Hollywood movie, is not at nighttime, but usually around noon or 1 p.m. in the daytime. Even if you're wealthy, candles and torches and oil lights are expensive. So if you can cut back on that, great. So use as much daylight as possible, including for cooking. And you sort of see how the typical uh, kitchen of an upper-class household would have looked right here. To make fritters, pots with cooking oil would have been placed directly in the coals. But for roasting or toasting, spits and grills of wrought iron, varying in length and thickness, depending on the size and weight of the food to be cooked, were used. So, for example, one, two, three, four, five. These are not chickens, notice these are hogs. This is one very long spit and some very long basting spoons. And this poor kid, uh, probably a kitchen scallion or maybe in some cases a kitchen wench, stuck turning the spit for hours at a stretch. Wow, you thought you had a boring job. Anyway, the spits would be placed right over the fire or maybe off to the side, often resting on the andorons or a similar contraption, and then, as I said, turned by a kitchen scallion. You can see here also, this had been one of the sort of cranes or beams. You could hang the pot from it, lower right there to make it really hot, bring it higher up, lessen the heat. Same thing as you see here. Frying pans came in various depths and sizes, and these are all depictions from the Middle Ages of the various pots and pans in use. I don't think I need to go through every single one, do I? Or maybe that's uh, a topic for a future video. But these are similar to the frying pans and pots and pans we use today. Again, cooks either holding them directly over the fire or placing them on a tripod above the fire. So these would be sort of, actually they're not sitting in the dish. The fire is beneath, or in this case, it's kind of an oven. This whole thing has been heated to a high level. So in many ways, it's sort of a baking, you might say. This of course is directly in the fire. And again, the same thing here, this would be a medieval oven. For baking, pies, tarts, pastries, and bread might just be put in a covered pot and embedded in coals, or perhaps put in a portable oven, almost like what we would call today a Dutch oven. But there were ovens built into the masonry of the fireplace, like I showed you the previous one, or even a separate oven in the bakehouse, again, to make sure of dangers of fire, but also very hot. So here, of course, is the oven. Uh, another one here. This is more likely a bakehouse. And this is definitely a bakehouse. Uh, these are all, well, it'd be nice if they were pizzas, but I'm pretty sure they are not on the outside. The medieval oven, like its ancient counterparts and parts like this, which are still in use around the world, were normally heated by lighting a fire within. And once the oven walls were sufficiently hot, the coals and ashes were removed, and the pies, tarts, pastries, and bread put into the oven on a flat hardwood peel, kind of like you're putting in a pizza today in a pizza oven. 
So again, uh, the fire will be inside. Everything would be super hot by the end. You put out the fire, nothing but coals and ashes should be left. Uh, haul it all out. And then inside you just put all the stuff you wanna bake. Try not to touch the walls. They are gonna be red hot. More equipment was needed to cook than simply an oven and hearth. As I said, pots and pans, knives and cutting boards. Cooks and their helpers, the sous chefs, the scallions, everyone else would of course wear long aprons and did most cutting on a very solid table. Most dining tables, as seen in another video, are simply boards laid over trestles, but these are dedicated tables, being their main work surface. Sometimes you might have a dedicated chopping block. So these, of course, would be the tables. This is more like a dedicated chopping block. And this is, oh my God, this chef looks like he's about to kill this guy. Ooh, that does not look good. Utensils and containers as shown here. And again, uh, ones that still survive. Uh, examples based on them. These, of course, are drawings from the Middle Ages of the various types. And perhaps in a future video, I'll go through each one separately. But the utensils and containers included flesh hooks, the big stirring spoons for those large cauldrons, the long-handled basting spoons, the one I showed you earlier, the guy over the spit, very long, uh, ladles, graters, rasp, sieves, tongs, cleavers, knives, various types of knives, wet stones to sharpen them, mallets, whisks and brooms made out of twigs, oven shovels, again, to shovel the coals and ashes out, plus an assortment of hampers, basins, ewers, flasks, platters, trenchers, salt boxes, salt shakers, mortars, pestles, and cloths, the cloths for both cooking and along with scouring sand or ashes and tubs for cleaning the kitchenware. Also, some cloths for making puddings for steeping spices and other things in containers. Waffle irons, as seen here, consisted of two flat planes with interlocking handles. They were often part of the kitchens of the nobility and upper classes due to the popularity of waffles and cookies in the Middle Ages, despite the mostly lack of sugar. In towns and cities, well, how would these uh, groceries and stuff be brought in? Well, in the very early morn, either at dawn or shortly thereafter, wives and daughters of all but the wealthiest merchants and guildmasters and if there were noblemen in town, the wives would not go out, but probably the chefs, assuming the chefs weren't still drunk or hung over, uh, their cooks and servants might go out instead of them, would hit the town markets to shop for the day's dinner before beginning even to cook for the day. So assuming that you would even have a breakfast, again, look for another video on that. You would, uh, the wives would spend most and the women spend most of the morning cooking for the main meal of the day, which is around noon, maybe one o'clock at the latest. And then supper would follow later in the day because of the problem of preserving the leftovers before they go bad. After the day's trip to the market, as I said, all across medieval Europe, no matter your class or status, Women spent the morning preparing and cooking the main meal of the day, as I said, the noon dinner. So you'd roasting, boiling, baking, or grilling meat, and maybe also soaking the meat. Much of the meat and fowl, fish, had been heavily salted down to preserve it. So normally you'd have to soak it for a day or maybe two, maybe longer, depending on how bad it was, to get the salt out. So you'd have your meat that you're going to prepare for four days from now, busily soaking, trying to get all the salt out of it. So as I said, roasting, boiling, baking, or grilling meat, cooking soup or stew or pottage, which is kind of the same thing, concocting sauces and aspics. An aspic described in another video, it's like a jello, except it is gelatin 
encasing meats and vegetables and such as a way to preserve them longer for leftovers, or baking pies, pastries, cakes, and fritters. Leftovers from this main meal, of course, as I said, were then, due to the problems of food preservation for cooked meals, there are no ice boxes or refrigerators. They would then be eaten for the evening supper, and if anything else was actually left over of that, it would then be eaten for the next day's breakfast. Now, since every foodstuff had two humoral qualities, which determine what type of cooking to use, is it cold or dry, heat or wet, whatever, especially for meats, good cooks had to know and use this. In fact, it was not unusual for the physician being employed by the upper class, um, owner of these kitchens, to work alongside the cook as a kind of nutritionist. So the cooks had to know and use this. Example, since pork was considered cool and moist, these qualities had to be counteracted by the warming and drying of roasting. And also, that would account for other ingredients into it and for various desserts and side dishes. You thought cooking was complicated today. A feature of medieval food preparation was multiple cooking. As I said, for example, the meat, anything had to be salt, had to be for soaked to get the salt out. And then it was usually boiled, especially if it's essentially just killed meat, totally fresh, usually boiled to soften it up, to cleanse and firm the flesh, and make sure it's well done. By the time it finished cooking, they don't really know anything about germs or anything, but they really don't want to eat anything raw. So first you'd boil it, and then you would either roast it or fry it or bake it or grill it or something. Fish, too, was subjected to multiple cooking. Often it would be taken entirely out of its skin, the flesh prepared, and then stuffed back into the raw skin, and the whole thing grilled or roasted before being encased in dough and then baked, kind of like in Jewish cooking, which you would call gefilte fish. But this was fairly common across Central Europe. So let me know what you thought and liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe as it will help me bring you more great videos. And don't forget to click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.